Uh, why don't we begin then with uh, Dr. Alex Klein. Um, again, uh, Alex is Vice President of Scientific Affairs uh, at CurePSP. Uh, Cure he earned his PhD in neuroscience from the University of uh, Freiburg in Germany. He's the author of several original research papers, reviews, and book chapters in the field of restoration of motor function using stem cells in the context of Parkinson's disease and Huntington's disease. Uh, Dr. Klein also holds a master's degree in biology from the University of Tübingen in Germany. Uh, previous to his appointment to Cure PSP, he worked as a scientific officer coordinating uh, European Union neuroscience uh, funding. I've known uh, Alex for several years. He's a very uh, uh, engaging speaker, a wonderful guy, and uh, uh, a great voice for Cure PSP. So, Alex, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. This is the largest family conference we ever had. This is absolutely fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming here, sharing the day with us. And uh, we would like to give you, you know, some hope how to manage the disease. You want, we want to, as Brad just said, we want to empower you to deal with your local physicians and neurologists and, um, you know, just get a better understanding of what we're dealing with. I would also, again, like to thank the Mayo Clinic for supporting us uh, and, and setting this up. This has been a truly um, easy, easy way to organize and set this up. Thank you very much. And I also would like to thank the, um, uh, the sponsors again. We have Abvi, we have Biogen in the room, we have Alexion and Lundbeck. Thank you very much. Um, so what we do usually is we have some disclosures at the beginning of every talk. I don't have any personal contracts with a third party company, but QPSP is working with industry together to make clinical trials happen. So here are our, uh, is our list of um, contracts we have currently. Um, at the beginning of my talk, I would like to give you a quick overview of who we are, how we operate and what we do and why you can call us. You know, I have, my pockets are full with business cards. Come find me, call us, call anybody of us because we're actually picking up the phone. You will talk to me, to my colleague Jacqueline, Sabrina, Dave. We have board directors here, Aline and um, Bill. So um, please do, we all help you and we know what you're going through. So who are we? We're founded in 1990. We are New York, city based, but we do have um, a little office still down in Baltimore. This is where we were founded and that's where we started. We we're fairly small. We we're 10 employees. We we're trying to do a lot. So again, if you email us, you know, just kick ass, you know, kick me, you know, write emails. Alex, I wrote you two days ago. Um, we have a lot of emails. And, and please be patient. We tried really to accommodate all of you. We are serving the entire nation, but also interestingly, you know, we start serving other countries where there is no support whatsoever. We do have two new support groups in India of all places. Um, <clears throat> you will see also we tried or we started uh, translating everything into Spanish. Our outreach will also go to South America and of course this country as well. Um, we are, we serve in the prime of life neurodegeneration or tauopathies. I hope after my talk you will know a bit more what I mean by that. And of course our vision is a world free of PSP, CBD and related diseases. Um, our work is based on three pillars, uh, cure, care and consciousness. And by cure I mean that we're working with researchers together that we do have a, uh, um, a funding portfolio. We actually give money to research to conduct experiments to work on a therapy. And you know, just literally the day, like minutes before we started, I talked to Dr. Beauvais, hey, see you in Denver in about four or six weeks when we discuss the latest results. So we are, with Mayo Clinic in particular, we're working very, very closely together um, on, on, on a therapy. Right, so the Mayo Clinic in, um, in Jacksonville, Florida, for example, hosts one of the largest um, brain, donation, uh, brain, brain banks in the world. So researchers need to study the brain, and I will come back to brain donation in particular later during my talk. So this is really something, it is a really good collaboration between nonprofits, um, hospitals, academia, and industry. 
Um, the, the second uh, point here is care. Well, here we are. We really care for you. We care where it, it touches us when we listen to the stories behind uh, you know, what you're experiencing. And um, there are also tears in the office. Um, this is very close to our heart. And you know, it's some, you know, please identify yourself if you have spoken to me. Um, this is really like a family and we're, we're part of you. We're, we're coming to your kitchen table and um, we can talk. Um, that's why we're here. And the third part is consciousness. And I, it, it, this becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, because, you know, technically we are only 23,000 PSP patients, for example, 3,000 CBD patients in uh, the United States. But <clears throat> we need to create awareness around these diseases. Um, it's a big problem. I assume that many of you went through a Parkinson's disease diagnosis at first, or maybe even worse, an Alzheimer's diagnosis. So the misdiagnosis is still a big problem. Um, uh, even in bigger centers, sometimes you don't get the real diagnosis. And we really need to create awareness around PSP and related diseases within the healthcare community. That's really important, but also, of course, within you. Um, the prime of life, Dr. Beauvais um, already mentioned that. You see here, prime of life. And um, we, we, we serve those three diseases where you see the arrows. These are our main diseases we serve, also traditionally. But interestingly, research has shown that CTE, ALS, and FTD are somewhat related to PSP, CBD, and MSA. And we believe that you know, anybody who wants to know more about these diseases can come to us and we educate, and particularly in the support groups, everybody is welcome. From a research point of view, it makes absolutely sense to look at these diseases a bit more holistically so that we understand what, what are the differences and what are the commonalities. Um, so how does it look like, care and consciousness? Um, you find on our table in your information brochures, but also we can always send this to you. This is for PSP, CBD, and MSA. Um, we, we try to provide uh, material that you can study, you can give to your relatives because you might get annoyed because if somebody tells you for the 10th time, oh, you're having Parkinson's disease, right? It's like, no. No, it's the atypical, it's the other one. It's PSP, so people can read this rather than you reiterating all, all the time. Um, but also, this can help for your primary care physician. You know, Give that to people who, who care for you because most probably they have never heard about PSP, CBD, and MSA. Again, I said already, we have a Spanish version of this very soon. We also will have a light version of our website um, and you know again we have also Sabrina who speaks Spanish and Portuguese so uh, you can come and call us and we can talk to relatives friends etc etc if needed also in those languages um, that's also something really important I would say what every social worker physiotherapist occupational therapist speech language pathologist should know because quite often you're on your own. You may not have been that beautiful support system from the Mayo Clinic, but then you need, you're on your own and you need to educate everybody around you, as I said. And those brochures here are actually written not in your language, but they are written in the physician's language or in a PT, OT, SLT language. And that's also really helpful. Call us, write us an email, we send all the material to you if you run out, right? You know, give it to every healthcare professional you're interacting with. Um, we're very proud of our guidebook. Um, you can also call us. We send it to you. This is actually an excerpt from uh, the guidebook. And we're particularly this part, we're trying to improve very much because only a healthy caregiver can be a good caregiver. And I think Eileen will talk about that more. And we're both very passionate about that. Um, <clears throat> The guidebook, you know, sort of this is when Cure PSP can be part of, of your family life. Use this book, you know, write in it. It has the full literature we have 
and more. It's, it's what, you can, what you should do if someone has PSP, CBD, or MSA. Um, I also recommend that you come to our website. The website is, of course, updated more frequently than any printed literature. And um, so you can see here, I hope you can see that from the back, we have, you know, this is what we, pre pre um, what we can offer you to help you in supporting you through the course of the disease. We have respite services here, support groups, brain donations, centers of care, clinical trials, family conferences, here we are, and here, big button here, request for information, and we send you everything you need. Um, we're very proud of, you know, as a very small nonprofit that we're serving a lot of people across the country. We don't have support groups in every corner of the country, but we're trying hard and it's actually going extremely well with our, um, you know, outreach right now. So what we have, we have in-person support groups, online support groups and peer supporters. And I should also add, just occurred to me right now, um, we do have a forum which is brand new, brand new as in January this year. And, um, you know, when you call me and say, Alex, um, you know, I have XYZ symptom, what should I do? You know that, unfortunately, lawyers were talking before our phone conversation and I'm not allowed to tell you anything over the phone. Um, I can do that sometimes a little bit off the record and I will do it as much as I can and bend the law a little bit. Um, but on the forum, you, you guys discuss. And if you discuss, you know, feeding tube, yes or no, where do I get in my area? Where do I get a wheelchair? Maybe there are people from your area uh, and that we have been talking about wheelchairs, you know, things like that. Any, any issues you have, um, go to the forum. <clears throat> Here, this is our support group finder tool. You can go to our website and you see here, you can choose different categories. One is center of care, peer supporters, and support groups. And, you know, when I uh, did the screenshot yesterday, of course, I was in New York, so the map shows me New York. If you are here in Minnesota, it will center automatically <clears throat> the map to Minnesota. And you see these telephones here uh, and these green you know, three people, this is support groups. You can select, filter, and you can click on these icons and uh, telephone numbers, driving directions, everything will pop up. Um, also, this is Dr. Larry Golby. Uh, he has been studying PSP for more than 30 years, I would say. Um, he he was kind enough, he's part of our board of directors and he's also the head of our scientific advisory board. And, um, you know, we, we asked him, can you, can you give, make a, a little video clip for us so that we can ask you a question and you answer. And then people can watch it on YouTube or on our website. So, for example, what are the psychological effects, uh, psychological effects of PSP, CBD and related diseases? What is the prevalence? How can we make the most of the time left, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Those little questions that came from you, we ask him and he gives one minute answers. <clears throat> we also are aware of that this has been also a financial roller coaster for most of you. Um, we have a wonderful donor, a wonderful family, the Levian family, who donated um, a significant amount of money for respite services. So what I encourage you, you just go to our website or talk to us here in the room today and um, we have the Quality of Life Fund that helps you with in-home care. So while your loved one is still in the home, at home, we can provide you financial help with getting care into your home. Um, I found this Guardian article and that really upset me and that also led to one of our latest initiatives. Um, because we want to make sure that you get really good care. And again, you are not alone. And I think this shows it also really beautifully today. Um, I have PSP. The neurologist said, I can't do anything for you. This is, this is horrible. 
at least tell them, well, go call QPSP, be active. If you don't know of QPSP, well, then search, search the internet. We pop up quite, or quite high up um, on, on Google. So this is actually really what we're dealing with. Also that when I said consciousness, that we have to educate the healthcare professionals that there is actually a, a, a nonprofit that is caring for you, right? So I think that's really important. So what we developed is uh, a concept of the QPSP centers of care. We would like to go nationally and identify centers who know how to treat and deal with PSP, uh, CBD and MSA patients. This is a brand new thing. We started in, in February. You know, we're talking to Mayo, of course, that, you know, because this is such an international and wonderful center, that uh, they will be on our map as well. So, you know, go to the website again, and you can identify QPSP centers of care. And here we are so far, and I hope that we have Mayo Clinic here very soon. Again, this is still, you know, we're still launching. We're about, and, and, and this is really, and, and we have been in contact with um, you know, uh, uh, centers here in the middle of the country, and there will be many more centers to come, right? We're, we're talking to people in, in Texas, in Kentucky, in Nebraska. So all these centers which are not really known to have these big centers, medical centers, and we really want to avoid that we have this kind of two coastal thing. Um, we have big interest in that, and you know, just to give you an example, um, these centers will be, on a self-reported survey, they will be evaluated, right? So we have to guarantee some certain level of care. But for example, distance to the next major clinical center is one of the factors. And that is actually overwriting, even if you don't have the latest brand new MRI technology in your center, we don't care so much. It's more important that we have centers who know how to treat PSP patients. So, Please you know, stay tuned. This will be filled very, very soon. Then, just very briefly, you know, Dr. Beauvais will talk about research. I will just tell you what we're doing. We have something like called like Venture Grant Program. We have an in-home care research, genetics consortium, clinical trial support, and the Mayo Clinic Brain Bank. Um, we're very proud of this uh, Venture Grant Program. We're proud of all of these, but that. <laughs> is actually a very smallish um, research program. It's $100,000 for up to three years for researchers. And what we're trying to do with this is, well, established researchers can apply, but you know, small biotech companies, young early career academic researchers, the crazy guys that with the new brand new ideas, we would like to really support those people that they actually come up with new ideas. And this is going on now for about 15 years. So it's, it's, it has a long standing in the field and is actually quite highly um, respected because we have NIH style, National Institutes of Health style peer review. There is no favoritism. This is independent international reviewers. Look at these applications to cure PSP that we fund only the best and maybe the craziest ideas that have the most benefit for the field. Um, with our um, colleague, Dr. Jory Fleischer, we have an in-home care project where we, uh, she's at Rush University in Chicago. Um, th she had the, the crazy idea, what, what happens if we take a neurologist, a, a nurse, and a social worker, and rather than you guys coming to the clinic, we go to the patient. Sounds crazy, you know, in a world of, you know, making money and, you know, high salaries, et cetera, et cetera, to, to think about that three people at the same time, you know, can see only one patient, then need to travel and see another patient, need to travel, maybe doing, well, well, maybe seeing three to four patients a day. Interestingly, you can imagine, of course, everybody would love that, uh, particularly if you have issues with mobility but also the rate of improvement of quality of life is unheard of. We had never had that before. Hospitalization is going down, less falls, because also your home will be analyzed. You know, the nurse will walk through your home. 
Maybe you have a brown sausage dog on a brown rug. You see what I'm saying? Like, there are the fall, I, I'm falling on, you know, with that little sausage dog, right? So I, I'm just saying, you know, little things that help. The social worker will identify little projects in your neighborhood. Maybe there is a public pool with some, you know, exercise, water gymnastics, you, had, you name it. Maybe there's in the local library, there's something you hadn't heard about it. You know, these kind of things, hugely successful. Um, we have a genetics consortium, also international consortium, looking at um, your genes. We know it's not a genetic disease. Um, there's very, very, very few cases, and Dr. Bouvet can talk more about that, but um, it's a sporadic disease, don't get me wrong. But it's interesting for us to see if with all PSP patients, maybe we see a pattern of things that might be different to people who have not uh, PSP or have Parkinson's or Alzheimer's disease. Um, you know, with these companies also in the room, there are right now two major clinical trials out there. We, try, we help to um, educate about clinical trials, but also uh, we help to recruit patients for these trials. And then um, research needs to look at human tissue. You know, we had quite a history of failed trials in the past. And one thing is if you look only, you know, if you do research based only on, on, on rat and mouse experiments, you know, there is fortunately, there is a difference between rats and mice and us. Um, so we do need to look at uh, human tissue. And the brain donation program is hugely successful. Um, so I said, I'm doing a little bit brain 101. You know, we're talking about disease a lot today, so let's do a little bit of fun stuff this morning. Um, I just want to crack three myths of the brain with you that I'm sure you all have heard about. Um, we use only a fraction of our brains, and I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm aggressively, violently say no. <laughs> um, this has been an interview with Albert Einstein quite a while back. And in a very humble way, he said, I feel that I, know <laughs> I use only 10% of my brain. That's how it all started. It was a, a newspaper interview. And of course, anything Albert Einstein would say, this is kind of, okay, I take that for granted. Um, so, no, we use 100% of our brain. Some areas might be at times a bit quieter, but we all use 100% of our brain. Because what my example is here, Let's, let's assume a very, very small impact to the brain, a small stroke size of my you know, thumbnail here. Still, stroke patients have huge impact, motor impairments, you know, can't talk, can't, you, know, um, you know, one half of the, the body might be paralyzed, et cetera, et cetera. So why would these stroke always happen in the 10% of the brain if the 90% are not used? So I'm just saying, so we use every, every corner of our brain. Um, adults can't grow, grow new brain cells. You know, the good thing, I actually, <laughs> I haven't started my mission yet. Um, we all go to Google. <laughs> my mission is that, well, still, I use it. Everybody uses it. Um, but it can be more a burden than a blessing. Um, because you also have to understand that it is easier to publish for researchers and clinicians something that is a little bit outside the box, so the complicated cases. And they pop up in Google, and they give you the very doomed, very gloomy uh, you know, impression of what's going on in the field, maybe. So, same here. You will, you will read that the brain indeed can grow new brain cells. But think about disease. Think about the rate of new brain cells. It's certainly not enough to compensate for disease. So don't get tricked into this. You know, some people misuse that information and tell you, I can increase your, your, your cell growth in the brain and with that product and that vitamin, whatever it is, you know, I can help you. Um, I think I, I, I'm ready to call the police, to be honest, when I read that, because it's, it's misleading, it's wrong. Um, for that reason, yes, you can grow new cells, 
if you grow new cells, it's part of your learning experience, um, but it certainly cannot, unfortunately, compensate for disease. And this is a, this is a good one. <laughs> male brains are biologically better suited for math and science, female brains for empathy. Hell no. <laughs> uh, there is, University of Toronto made a really, really exciting experiment. So <clears throat> they asked students to come in uh, on two separate dates. They didn't know of each other, separate groups. Um, one group of students had to, well, perform a math test and attended a lecture right before the exam where the presenter said, well, actually, what I just wrote here, this is kind of true. Guess what? The results were the boys did better than the girls. A couple of days later, different group, new presentation, seeing that there is no difference between male and female brains in terms of performing math. Guess what? Same results. So what I'm saying is, you know, this is actually my favorite slide when I talk to high school students, and particularly the girls in the room, you know, girls stand up for your rights. This is important. There is no different, there are differences between male and female brains, don't get me wrong. But you know, this is, for example, something that society puts on us. And I think that's really exciting to see that how we can you know, nurture versus nature, etc., etc., how we can be influenced in our performance and behavior. Um, let's do a bit of theory. And the next slide actually will hurt me personally because you may have heard that from my accent, I'm German. So um, I don't know, it's, that joke might be difficult in the US, but you know, this is how my brain looks like. That's a, foot, that's a soccer ball. Ouch. So, <laughs> and here's the American brain. <laughs> uh, anyway, so, uh, yes, okay, we, we're out from the World Cup. I get it, I get it, I get it. Okay, for the first time ever. Like, anyway. Um, so that's in the brain, that's, uh, that's our brain, that's how it looks like. And um, so this is a healthy brain, but this is composed of neurons, nerve cells. And um, you know, you see here, this is a cell body, it says here, and this is the axon, that's kind of that lengthy thing, you know, we have an axon here, or we have a cell here, and then it kind of has to communicate with other parts of my body. So this part can be actually fairly long. And then we have another neuron here that needs to receive signals from this neuron here. So this is how information is conveyed in the brain all through our bodies to our little toes and you know, whatever you want, want to move. Um, but now is something I don't understand. And I have to be honest with you. you know, I, I studied the brain. I'm a neuroscientist. Um, you know, this is another example of a neuron here, right? This is the cell body. And if we now start counting, and people were quite busy counting, as you can tell, <laughs> we have 100 billion neurons. And let's go through this here for a second. One neuron is about 10 micron, micrometer wide. Sorry, I'm metric. <laughs> Second disclosure today is I'm metric. Um, but I, I did some conversion here. So if this is the average width of a neuron, and this is 10 micrometers, if you go for 10 neurons, it's 100 micrometers, 100 neur uh, sorry, 10 neurons, 100 neurons is one millimeter. Then we go 1,000 neurons, one centimeters, 100,000 is one meter. It's already almost three and a half feet already. And you know, if we keep aligning all the cells in your brain, you have 100 billion neurons, everybody of us in the brain, and if we align them next to each other, just to kind of get you, give you an idea what's going on in the brain, we have 100 billion neurons down here, and if we would just, in a very, maybe very German fashion, we like, love order, <laughs> right? So we do all of that, it, it'll be 100,000 kilometers or 62,000 miles. Um, I'm giving you that example because you may be impatient or frustrated or even upset with us, with the researchers, with the clinicians that there is no cure. 
you know, look at the cancer field, they, they proceeded and then progressed in terms of therapy very, very well. But what about us? I'm just telling you this, how do we, how do we fix this? How do we learn how the brain can actually communicate? Just here as an example is the Earth circumference is 25,000 miles. Just to give you an idea how complicated the brain is. Um, just to give you also another um, kind of example how, how complicated that is, you know, I did this yesterday. When you start at the QPSP office and you drive all the way to Rochester to the Mayo Clinic here, um, it would be almost 53 road trips. And then you would greet every single neuron of yours, you know, along the way. This is just, again, to understand how complicated the brain is. Um, all right, and to make it even more complicated, um, we have five trillion supporting cells. And this is, these are numbers, maybe the finance department and DC may understand this, but I really don't. This is, I really, I have no concept what that actually even means. I can understand we have 320 million Americans, even that across the country is kind of a, I don't understand this, right? I live in, in Queens, apparently we have four million people in Queens. That's when I start maybe understanding what four million actually means in terms of real numbers. Um, so let's go quickly through disease. Um, I will kind of run, I'm running out of time. Um, I will kind of rush through this a little bit because we do have more disease talks later. Um, so PSP, just in a nutshell, um, just to go through this again. So what is it? It affects movement, control of walking, balance, speech, swallowing, vision, sleep, mood, behavior, thinking. Um, this is the result of damage to nerve cells in the brain, the guys we were just talking about. Progressive means the disease worsens. Palsy means causes weakness by damaging certain parts of the brain above nerve cell clusters called nuclei that control the eyes. And I think now we start understanding you know, that means supranuclear. We know that PSP has some eye problems, um, which is written here. Um, we have about 20,000 uh, 20, Americans have PSP. PD, Parkinson's disease, about 1 million. Alzheimer's is about 5.5, right? So that gives you also an idea that, yes, indeed, it is not very common. Um, we talked about prime of life. It was discovered in 1964, and currently we have no effective treatment, unfortunately. Um, CBD, almost the same symptoms, just different weight maybe of symptoms. Um, we have, uh, in particular, apraxia, complex movements. That's also what is affected by CBD. Um, unfortunately, uh, you don't have this as a printout, but it will be available online. So if you want to download this, you can actually always, you know, um, I think we have it on the website either, or yeah, I think we will have it on the website. Um, and again, it's the same, the disease it results from damage to nerve cells. Um, we have about 2,000 or 3,000, depending who you ask, uh, patients in the, in the US. It's even uh, less frequent than PSP. Uh, and again, we don't have an effective treatment for CBD. MSA, a little bit of difference here is that different patho pathology uh, uh, behind uh, MSA compared to PSP and CBD. But we have the MSA expert later, and I think um, we will learn more about MSA uh, during that talk. So. Um, excuse me that I rushed through this. We have about 13,000 Americans have MSA, and also there is no cure. What are the causes? We don't know. We don't know. Uh, it's, it's very unfortunate. There is some hints and ideas. You know, we have, uh, yeah, I showed you the videos of uh, Dr. Larry Golby. He also thinks that there might be some environmental impact, but the problem is measuring, and that's why I'm, I'm, I'm telling you this, is um, again, Google 
will make you wonder if there is something. You know, I've been a welder, I've been you know, exposed to pesticides, I've been exposed to whatever it was, maybe in a more rural area, or I live next to a six-lane highway. What does that do to my brain? Well, I can tell you it's not good to your brain. It's not good for your brain. But um, there are too many factors that we can actually really pinpoint right now to, yes, it was, you know, it was the diesel, it was the pesticide, it was yada, yada, yada. So, so far, uh, we don't have any correlation. Um, so just be careful with these uh, reports you read about um, environmental impact on your brain. Um, we have two different proteins, tau and alpha synuclein. Also that we will learn later. We will learn about that uh, in more detail. Um, they accumulate, uh, that meaning that, that proteins have a regular function in the brain and sometimes they get um, misfolded. They don't do get, get the, get the, 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 sorry, they don't get the, um, the regular 3D structure. So at that moment they start sticking to each other, accumulate and make a cell die. So that's actually when the neurodegeneration starts in the brain. Right, so that we have protein that is misfolding. I can actually show you that in the next slide. So misfolding of proteins, um, they all share that. We have with PSP, CBD, we have tau. We all have heard in the media uh, about Alzheimer's. It's tau and another protein called beta amyloid. We have MSA, it's alpha synuclein, and Parkinson's disease is also alpha synuclein. And you can see here that how this protein, this is the normal protein, and then suddenly it's misfolded and gets a completely different structure. It just cannot do what it's supposed to do. Um, I would like to talk just very briefly about the brain donation program, uh, which is in collaboration with the Tau Consortium and the Mayo Clinic. Um, again, we have uh, brochures that can be filled out, and we believe that brain donation is one of the uh, most powerful ways of getting involved with, um, with a research um, because breakthroughs in the brain depend on studies using donated post-mortem human brain tissue. Um, one brain can provide tissue for dozens, sometimes hundreds of neurological studies. And Dr. Beauvais and my colleague, Dr. Dennis Dixon at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida, he's literally the, the, one of the leading neuropathologists in the world. And we're working very closely with them together. And, um, you know, we do have these forms that need to be completed. But we have also our wonderful Rachel down at the Mayo Clinic. And, um, you know, all this is also on the website. You can always call me. My cell phone is actually on the website. You can call me 24-7. Um, and she will then take your hand and guide you through the process. She will also identify pathologists and um, every help you need during the process. I should also say that QPSP also thanks to a wonderful donor has uh, a budget that we can help you with up to $750 with all the costs that occur during a uh, brain donation. That can be either the transportation of the body or it can be also paying for the pathologist. We're very, very proud of that. And I think because of um, time issues, we can talk about clinical trials later, but I would like to stop here for now because um, the next speaker is on, right? Okay, thank you very much.